Finance. Hey, welcome everybody to the Financial Independence Podcast, the podcast where I get inside the brains of some of the best and brightest in the personal finance space to find out how they achieved financial independence. On today's episode, I'm excited to introduce Steve from ThinkSaveRetire.com. Steve's 35 and just retired in December, and now him and his wife are about to embark on a trip around the country in an RV. So they just sold both their houses, bought an RV, an Airstream actually, and they're, they've been living in it for the last year. And as soon as his wife steps away from work, uh, they're going to start a big trip around the States and just live in it full time. So I know a lot of people out there have dreams of traveling in an RV after they retire. So hopefully this episode is going to give you a lot of useful information. Steve's story is also very interesting because he wasn't frugal to begin with initially, but then you know quickly embraced the whole FI lifestyle and the frugality and really accelerated his path to financial independence. He discovered this whole scene in his 30s, declared that he wanted to retire by 40, but ended up doing it by the time he turned 35. So Lots of good stuff to unpack here. So, hey, Steve, thanks a lot for being here. I appreciate it. Thanks a lot for for having me. I've been looking forward to it. Yeah. So, where are you right now? I'm in Tucson, Arizona. We're finishing up our um, full time working careers. Well, actually, my my wife is. I retired in uh, December, and she's retiring at the end of the month, and we're going to set sail April first. That's exciting. So, congratulations. Um, and thanks so much. Uh, so you retired at the age of thirty five, and that was just last December. Yep, December twenty third was my last official working day. Yeah. Nice. How was that? It was. It's it's really hard to put it into words, knowing that you're thirty you're thirty five and you're done with with full time work. And usually, when I describe this uh, to people, I use the term "I'm retiring from full time work." I'm not just retiring, so I'm not going to hold down a full time job. But that doesn't necessarily mean um, that that I'm not going to do anything in the future. So I certainly had that in the back of my mind. You know, I'm not just going to sit, uh, sit there bored all day, but knowing that I'm free from having to hold down a job was a, it, it, it just continues to be an amazing feeling. That's awesome. Well, and, and for people that may not know your story, uh, could you just give a little background and uh, give a little intro to Think, Save, Retire? Yeah, sure. So I run the thinksaveretire.com blog. I originally started it about a couple years ago. Um, I was really dissatisfied with what I did for a living. I worked in IT and IT pays well, but it also has the um, it has the ability to just drain the life out of you uh, with with the demands and the schedules and the requirements and I mean it 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 it's always there. It's always this omnipresent thing that you're that you're thinking about. And I just didn't you know some people thrive under that kind of pressure, but I guess I'm just not that kind of person. Um, so to be honest with you, over the last five years, maybe 10 years, I've been considering like a career change kind of in the back of my head, but I never really went down that route because I felt like I was, I had these golden handcuffs on me where the money was just so great. Even though I didn't really like my job, um, I just couldn't get myself to change careers because I know my lifestyle would change so much. And I didn't want that initially. However, uh, back in 2013, I met my 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 wife, who, who uh, you know the the person who's now uh, now my wife. We got married a year later, um, and we both had a dream of travel. And neither of us gleaned all the all that much satisfaction out of our jobs. So it just kind of worked out so well. We we put two and two together. We we finally decided um, that if we if we save as much as possible, live a little bit more frugally now. Well, really, a lot more frugally now, <laughs> um, and save as much money as we possibly can. Maybe we can quit. The initial um, age time frame was by the time I'm 40, and it's interesting how this, you know, frugal lifestyle starts to snowball. You do one thing, you get used to it, then you do another, then another, then another, and your retirement date just rolls up slowly but surely every single time you make a change. It was so amazing. Um, and eventually we, we just got, uh, got to the point where, well, if we maximize our, um, our savings spending to the nth degree, uh, we might be able to get this thing, you know, done by the time I'm 35 and sure enough, it, it, it worked out that way. Yeah. That's been, it's been fun to watch your progression. Cause yeah, it was first 40 and then I think you dropped it down to 37 or 36 <laughs> and then the dropped, 36, yeah, yeah 36. Mm -hmm. And then you dropped it down again to 35 and yeah. And so we'll, we'll definitely <laughs> talk about that progression, um, but just so people know, like what, what was your job in it? I know you were the director 
of an IT group uh, at age 32, which is pretty impressive stuff. Um, but what what did you do before that? And then what did you do after that once you actually went to a telecommuting role? Yeah, I um, got a degree in IT and I worked the majority of my career just doing programming support roles. Um, I was a software developer, web applications develop, uh, developer for the longest time. Um, writing applications in languages like Java and JavaScript and PHP and, th and things like that. Um, I eventually got my opportunity to step up into a, into a director role because that role was vacant. Uh, the organization that I was working for at the time went through a major overhaul in their management structure. And um, I, wanted, I wanted to try my hand at leadership. And so I just kind of assumed that I had the job and I was I was actually told, pretend you have the job. So I went down that route. I really got exposed um, to the demands and responsibilities of a true leadership position. This was a director role. So it was two or three levels of management above um, what I was already at. So it was kind of, it was it was a big step. Um, but I ultimately realized, uh, in short order, mind you, that this really wasn't for me. All the all the politics and the management and the performance reviews uh, that that's just not that's not what I like to do. <laughs> yeah. So um, <laughs> it's so I ultimately demoted myself by moving to to another company into the uh, the uh, telecommuting role. Nice, and you went back to a more hands-on technical person. Yeah. Nice. Yep. Cool. Exactly. So I was doing database work um, remotely, which is which is an easy thing to do remotely. Um, and it was, you know, it I still wasn't all that satisfied, but it was good enough and the money was good. So, it yeah, it's well. amazing. Like I, as a developer myself, it's, you know, your whole career, you're you think you're either going to work your way into like a managerial role as a director or something like that or a manager of other programmers or maybe in a more like senior technical role like a a software architect or something like that. Sure. Um, sure. And when I realized that I was just going to retire early, it was like this huge weight had been lifted because like I loved the programming aspect of it and I hated dealing with people and I hated being the <laughs> go-to guy that needed to deal with like critical mm -hmm. software bugs. So like both of those trajectories were not appealing. Uh, but then, yeah, when I was like, well, this is probably my last job ever anyway. So what's the point of working my way up the ladder? Like I make good money as a programmer and I love that aspect of it. So that's, uh, uh, that's what I ended up doing. And it was, uh, I don't think that that would have happened if I hadn't found early retirement and financial independence. Yeah. I mean, I, I wrote an article a year and a half ago, some titled something like the awesomeness of not being important at, at your, at your role. And I mean, I went through the same kind of thing, right? I went to work, I did my job, I went home, I didn't care about raises and, and promotions and the stress just I mean, there, there was still a little bit of stress naturally because you are holding down a full time job. But it certainly um, was not to the level that um, that it was before. It was an awesome feeling. That's fantastic. I'll, I'll link to that in the show notes. And I actually haven't read that one yet. So I look forward to reading that after after this interview. Oh, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, and your wife, she's a rocket scientist. Is that right? Yes. Yes. She, um, she's, she's an actual r rocket scientist, which is kind of cool to say, even though she doesn't think it's that, that big of a deal, but, um, <laughs> but yeah, it's kind of cool. <laughs> uh, so that's cool. So, so she, she's in the same sort of position. She doesn't, she doesn't really like it or does she, do, she likes it, but she'd just rather be traveling with you. Yeah, exactly. She, she got a little, I mean, she gets a little bit more satisfaction out of her job than, than I do. She really likes her team and the people she works with. Um, but yeah, if it's that or a lifetime of travel and not having to worry about a full-time job, yeah, she definitely chooses the latter. Cool. So she's only got about a month left, you said? Yep. Um, the last day of March is her last working day. And then we, um, then we set sail for a while. Cool. Yeah. And we'll talk about setting sail and what that actually means. But um, I want to dive back into sort of how you well went from 40 to 35, because that's a pretty nice jump, especially considering you were probably in your 30s at the time when you make when you started making all these yes. decisions. Um, so definitely want to dive into that. Um, but I also want to point out that you weren't really naturally frugal. Is that right? Yeah, I would. I, I wasn't horrible, but I definitely was not frugal. That's that that is a correct statement. I made a lot. I, I mean, I made a lot of mistakes, a lot of financial mistakes. The year that I graduated from college, I blew half my salary on a uh, 99 Corvette convertible. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was fun, but it was such a money pit. Yeah. And you ended up putting like 25 grand on top of that. Yeah. To, like, soup it up, yeah. right? 
Yo, yeah, I put a Roots Tight Magnuson supercharger on top. It looked great when, when you popped the hood. sounded great. Uh, mm-hmm. GHL straight through mufflers, uh, headers, uh, race cam, uh, uh, twin disc clutch, uh, forged 390 rear end. I mean, it was it was a monster car, um, but it broke a lot. Um, fun to drive, but yeah, that's it's just not. <laughs> I mean, eventually, I got I got to the point. I think the water pump broke yet again and i was like okay as soon as i get this toe didn't fixed this thing is gone i am done <laughs> <laughs> nice okay so so not naturally frugal um no and, and you said 2013 is about when you sort of realized that, that's about right yeah yeah and and what was the catalyst was were you just searching online and stumbled across like mr money mustache or early retirement extreme or something like that or yeah it was more well when i first started my career my dad had mentioned something to me. He said, some people are on the 10 year plan. And at the moment, you know, I, or at, at that time, I didn't really give it much credence, but that was basically, I mean, some people live a, you know, a traditional life. You, you buy things, you get nice cars, nice homes, and then you retire in your sixties. Um, just like, you know, you have a, a traditional lifestyle in this country, but then some ta- some people choose the 10 year plan where you just save as much as you can and retire in 10 years. And that's always kind of been in the back of my head, but I didn't want it bad enough. Then my, then I met my my wife. We like to travel. Um, initially, when we got married, I, I was like, oh, cool. We have two salaries now instead of one. We can go out to eat. We could, we, we could do $100 dinners every month, that kind of thing. Um, but just this nagging, I don't know, element in the back of my head, just just it never went away. It kept it kept surfacing. Like you, but you don't like what you do. You don't like what, what you do. You don't like what you do. So there's got to be, there's got to be something else to your life than just working and spending money. And yeah, in, in 2013, uh, once we combined finances, um, yeah, we could spend a lot, but what if we save this instead? How early could we retire? And that's when I went online and it was mainly uh, the Mr. Money Mustache blog. I liked how, how he wrote. I liked how he kind of, you know, bashed society a little bit, a little bit passive aggressive here and there. You know, that that that's just the kind of the writing I, I, I like. And I really connected with that. And it just kind of snowballed from there. Nice. OK, so 2013, you, you make this sort of declaration that you want to retire at 40. Um, how did you bring it down so quickly? So you said that this sort of frugality started snowballing. Can you just take us through how that actually looked? Yeah, initially it was, you know, maybe we don't go out to eat as much or maybe we cancel, you know, cable television or magazines, those kinds of things, the the, the easy stuff. Um, but the more we got into it, the more it's like, well, you know, we don't live with this. Maybe we don't have to live with that either. Um, so, I mean, the, the more frugal you live, the more you, you just kind of get used to that lifestyle and you are willing to accept more and more and more. You're actually learning to live with less. And the more you do that, the easier it gets to live with less. Um, and you know, we, we walk the dogs every evening. We talk about what's going on in, in our lives, our futures, what, where, where, where we want to be. And you know, more and more a life of travel, a life of, you know, experiencing things rather than, than just spending money. Um, that, that was a recurring theme in our discussion. Um, so originally we wanted to move to Sedona and Sedona, Arizona is one of the most beautiful places I've ever seen. The red rocks are absolutely spectacular, but it's very expensive to live there. And we still wanted to travel, even if we did move there. So uh, we kind of went in a, in a circle um, from just you know relocating to a relatively expensive area to what if we don't live anywhere permanently and we just move around from, from place to place. So what do we have to do to put the pieces in place uh, to, uh, to get to that point? And I think that that's really where the extreme, and I use that term loosely, um, extreme frugality really comes into play. Where if we really want this bad enough, let's sell both of our homes. Let's get into this 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 Airstream or RV, whatever we we um, we wanted at the time. I don't think we initially wanted wanted an Airstream. We just wanted something that um, that was mobile. Um, so yeah, selling both homes, not spending money on on anything that that isn't absolutely critical. 
And uh, yeah, your your retirement moves up fast. Yeah, definitely. So you so you, I'm assuming in 2013 you weren't saddled with a bunch of debt or anything. Maybe you had a couple mortgages on the houses or something. But... Mortgages, yeah. Um, I think I had an auto. I think I had an auto loan at the time. Um, but other than that, yeah, I, I mean, zero credit card debt my, my entire life. I got, yeah, that, that was something my, my dad drilled into me, um, from a teenager. You never, ever, ever let, let credit card debt ride. So I certainly didn't have that, which was, uh, which was nice. Nice. So, so how long did it take to really unwind your previous, maybe more consumerism lifestyles, uh, start unloading the houses and the cars and, uh, is there any other big things that you sold to help increase that net worth and lower that spending? Um, yeah, really homes, uh, subscriptions to, you know, either magazines or, or self or, you know, we, we, we don't upgrade our cell phones every year like we used to. Um, it, things have, things have become a lot more simple and it's almost like I almost get a high every, every time I get rid of something that I used to spend money on that I used to, believe brought me happiness that no longer does it 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 really is kind of kind of like a high for me so i almost like i like doing it and once we shed ourselves of our second home we i i owned a home and my wife owned a home uh, we sold my wife's first mine second and once we got rid of my house which is which was our remaining home it was i don't know it was this feeling of ecstasy it's like i'm no longer I'm no longer tied down with a mortgage or tied down to a location. I don't have to worry about renters. Um, that was that was just an, an an amazing feeling, and I think I kind of got used to that feeling over the years of get ridding stuff, getting rid of stuff rather, and I just couldn't stop. <laughs> yeah, I, I can't agree more. Uh, yeah, when we sold our house, I was just felt so good not to be tied to that place and uh, for sure have complete freedom. So, did you? I assume you sold or gave away most of your stuff, or do you have big storage unit somewhere hiding all the all no. the things from two houses? <laughs> now, yeah, we we sold um, or gave away probably ninety nine percent of our our things. Uh, my brother in law made out like a bandit. He 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 got a lot of our stuff that uh, that we didn't want, including you know computer parts and monitors and things like that. Um, we do we do have some things stored, like maybe a container or two of stuff at my in-laws place in in their garage but other than that we just got rid of everything and we 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 don't miss a thing about what what we used to have that's so good so so we haven't even touched on this yet but uh maybe tell everybody where you're talking from now and what you've been doing for the last year yes i am um, sitting inside our 2005 airstream classic and we've lived in this airstream full time since April 1st, April Fool's Day of 2016. Uh, so we've almost lived in here for a full year now. And we went from a, a 1,600 square foot house to a 200 square foot airstream with very little storage. <laughs> <laughs> and the initial transition was, I don't know, I guess it was a little intimidating, but there was also an element of excitement in it. And the one thing that I think that is remarkable is how quickly we get used to our living arrangement. So it took about a week or two for us to, you know, get settled into our new routine. But honestly, every morning I, I wake up, I don't even think about the fact that, man, I'm only living in 200 square feet. I want a house again. I, I don't think I've ever thought, uh, thought about that. You just kind of, you know, you fall into your routine. You don't think about it and you just, you're just, you find happiness um, in whatever s situation you happen to live in. Well, that's really cool. And yeah, uh, you have some good YouTube videos where you show a little bit of the the Airstream and the way it's laid out. It does like I was trying to imagine myself living there and it seems yeah mm -hmm. totally fine. It looks like there's plenty of space to do everything that I currently do. Um, and it seems like it would be pretty comfortable. But were there, were there ever any like freak out moments where you're like, oh shit, what have we done? <laughs> <laughs> nope i it was it was more like oh shit why didn't we do this sooner mm. that's i mean that I mean, we, we we don't have we don't have the backyard or we don't have a tool shed you know th those kinds of things but you know there's always a way to to get around that you take what's important to you and we have some storage in in the truck that's where my my tools sit so really everything that i want i i have here i just may not be 
to the you know to the degree to the volume that I might have in in a larger house. But I have never you know ne- neither my wife or I have regretted this uh, this decision at all. Oh, that's great to hear. Um, so you've mainly been just uh, in Arizona, is that correct? Because your wife's still working. <laughs> yes. Yes. So you're pretty. So you have you like a monthly lease or parking space or what's what's the situation there? We're we're at a campground here where we um, we rent by the month. Um, which means it's a it, it's a certain price for your quote unquote rent, but then you also pay for whatever electric you you happen to use on top of that, and that's really it. So right. ev- everything, one hundred percent of your monthly expenses, just goes to the campground. <clears throat> right, okay, and you and, just got some solar panels installed too, so that should bring down your electric. Is oh, that right? <clears throat> oh yeah. I mean, we're paying. Granted, it's the winter. Um, so, um, electric will be a little bit lower anyway, but, um, uh, the last four, three or four months, we've paid a total of eight bucks in power usage. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. Yeah. That is pretty good. Of course, solar is not cheap and we certainly did not install solar to save money in the long run. We, we, we installed solar for the flexibility of being able to boondock and live absolutely free wow. um, out, out there in, in the middle of nowhere and still be able to generate our own power. That's really cool. Um, so how, how much does your monthly parking place run, uh, the, the monthly fee that you pay the campground? Yes. Um, here it's seven seventy five a month, which is actually pretty high, but we're at like a quote unquote resort campground. So it's really, it's really nice. We have, you know, citrus trees. I have an orange tree right behind the airstream. Um, there's lemon trees around, there's pools, hot tubs, laundry uh, facilities. So it's really, a like a self-contained, almost like a city in here. Oh, wow. Um, so that this is this is definitely one of the more expensive uh, places to stay, but we're okay with that expense because we are still working full time. Well, my my wife is now, but we both were through uh, 2016, so we were certainly okay with with, with that expense. But uh, but yeah, once we retire, um, we we won't pay anywhere near 775. We in fact we won't we probably won't stay in a campground um, more than half the month in any given month. Cool and. While you're in the campground, do you like use their showers and things like that? Or do you try to, is it all within, do you try to stay within the Airstream itself? You know, I used to stay within the Airstream itself and, and it was perfectly fine. There was no real problem with that. But, you know, while I have the nice shower facilities, I might as well use it. Sure. Um, so, yeah, yeah, I have been using the, uh, the the showers here and, of course, the hot tub and the pool and th- things like that. But, um, uh, but yeah, I, you know. We're we're paying for these amenities, so we so we might as well use them. <laughs> sure, sure, absolutely. So, utilities are a lot lower. Your rents, you know, reasonable, um, and will be a lot lower once you hit the road. Um, yep. And I'm assuming that an airstream and a truck to pull it is cheaper than a normal house. Is that right? Depending on what truck uh, you get. <laughs> yeah, and especially if you buy a used airstream, um, the. When this thing was new, the, the the airstream that we're living in now, when it was new in 2005, it was probably around 130. Oh wow! Um, which is really expensive. And new airstreams today are around that same price, even a little bit more expensive. Um, but we were we got in um, airstream and truck for I want to say 65, oh, maybe wow. okay. so. Uh, so yeah, it it's it's definitely a lot cheaper, and you can go cheaper than than us you certainly don't need to buy an airstream you can buy a ten thousand dollar trailer and a five thousand dollar truck too so you you can make it significantly lesser expensive or or less expensive than um than the price that uh, that we paid but but we happen to like the airstream we like the the design we like the you know the it's it's like this classic you know our rv in in america so we kind of like that that feel and it's well built so um we uh, we thought the cost was worth it for us. Cool. Yeah, that's that's actually less than I would have expected. I think um, my grandparents, when I was young, they always used to have those like massive tour bus size RVs. That oh must yeah, have cost a fortune, which were a lot of fun to to go on trips with them with. But uh, yeah, it must have been a fortune. Um, have you had any issues towing it, or is it is that been pro- relatively easy? Uh, it's been so easy. Has it? Oh, good. Yeah, we have a we have a Dodge twenty five hundred HD and it pulls it like like there's nothing behind it. Um, we we um, we have a nice hitch too. We have like a thirteen hundred dollar hitch that we bought used. 
Um, so that that helps a lot with um, with with the towing, the quality of towing, and not being blown around in the wind and things like that. But cool. yeah, it's been nothing but nothing but um, but good times so far. And how about uh, gas mileage on something like a setup? Yeah, like that? Um, when we're towing on relatively flat roads, we're looking at between ten and twelve miles a gallon. Oh, okay, um, which isn't bad for towing a ten thousand pound. Um, but when I'm not towing, I get between 15 and 16, depending on, depending on how I drive. Um, but my parents, by the way, lived in a, in an RV for 13 years full time. And they did have one of those buses, those huge, you know, 42 foot, yeah. you know, three, three slide outs. And they got, I think three or four miles a gallon Wow. Uh, in that thing. So uh, <laughs> yeah. big difference, big no, difference. <laughs> oh, that's good. So are there any other costs that I may not be aware about or is that, is that pretty much everything? Um, well, there's, there's insurance and there's healthcare. Um, but other, other than that, yeah, I think you, um, think you covered everything. So an insurance, is that quite expensive on, uh, on an Airstream? No, actually it's quite cheap. It's, it's a few hundred every six months and it's about the same for the, uh, for the truck. So we're, we're in the six to $700, um, every, every six month range. So that, that works okay for us. Yeah. That's not bad. And then healthcare, what do you, what do you plan to do after your wife leaves? Yeah, that's something that, that we've thought about a lot. Um, we've toyed with, um, with like cobraing for the first year, but that may or may not be worth it. What we'll probably end up doing is going with one of those health share ministries. Um, We've gotten some feedback from other RVers who who have done the the uh, same thing, and they recommend. I don't even I don't remember the company off the top of my head. I think my my wife uh, remembers, but there's a a particular health share ministry that doesn't require a lot of you know beliefs and 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 you know how how you you live your life, which some health share ministries do. Right. But this one's pretty laid back and it's re- relatively inexpensive, so we'll probably go that route and spend. I don't know, 150, 200 a month for our, uh, for our healthcare. Oh, that's not bad. Have you, have you written about that at all? Not yet because nothing's official. Right. Once we actually sign on, on the dotted line, I'll probably write about that to, to let people know exactly what, what we're doing. Okay. And we probably won't get dental insurance at all. We'll just go down to Mexico and get, uh, get our dental work done there. Uh, we have many r- recommendations from dentists right across the border and they're set up to um to work on americans who just jump the border and go go right back so that's um, that's probably what we'll end up doing for that (laughs) nice cool so so your wife's got a month left and then you guys are hitting the road so what what is the future have in store for you well the first night we're going to spend well first two nights we're going to spend at at picacho peak which is just north of uh north of tucson Uh, it's it's a it's an area that we wanted to visit for a long time uh, but that's really on our way up to the northwest and that's where we're going to spend our first summer we're going to start in utah actually which is where my my folks now live and then we're going to go out to the oregon coast and spend the majority of our summer there wow and then is everything open ended after that or do you have some yeah. sort of tentative idea well my my wife might be conned into coming back to work for five, four or five months because her team really, really, really needs her. <laughs> um, so what we'll probably end up doing is spending the summer in Oregon and then kind of meandering our way slowly back down south. And we may spend um, this coming winter here in Tucson as well. Um, but other than that, we don't really have any hard and fast plans. In fact, we have campsites reserved for holidays, um, which is you know when you actually do want, need to have something reserved because holidays is when everybody uh, who has any interest in camping or RVing goes out and, and does that. So you definitely want a spot to stay in there. Um, but yeah, I mean, things are very, very open-ended, especially um, in 2018 and beyond. That's cool. And working for five or six months, that would be pretty fantastic, I think, because I just had my first like really vivid work dream last night, or I should say nightmare that I was like, I had this dream that I went back. And since, you know, when I left, they were like, Oh, you, you know, we'll give you letters of recommendation or whatever, if you need them. And obviously, I haven't been in touch because I'm not getting another job. So I haven't asked for them. So my dream was that I went back just to see everybody. And then they they thought I just couldn't get a job. So they felt so bad that they hired me back on. 
<laughs> and I was like trying to say like, no, I don't want the job. But say, no, I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> yeah. But then I ended up having it. And then, um, and yeah, it was like I was working again. And then I woke up this morning and I wasn't working and it was even better. <laughs> so it's like a nightmare averted. <laughs> exactly. So going back for five or six months and, uh, you know, seeing what you're not missing is, uh, probably going to be a really cool experience. And then make, exactly make 2018 even more exciting. Yeah, so technically what she's doing right now, she's taking a, a sabbatical. Um, so she she will be out with me uh, traveling for, you know, until October. Um, so that's uh, once, I guess, this time of 2018 rolls around, then there won't be a sabbatical. It, that that will probably be it. So, right. awesome. um, And it's always nice to have another five months of income coming in too. So <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And that'll make the transition a bit easier and yeah, less stressful, I'm sure. So um and then do you plan to stay within America or are you hoping to go south eventually or is that still really just not been talked about too much? Um well we have two dogs. So we, while we have our dogs with us, we'll probably stay in the continental US, maybe maybe Canada. Um, but we're certainly not going not to do any overseas traveling until uh, our dogs are no longer with us. But w- once that happens, then uh, definitely South America. <clears throat> In fact, uh, Costa Rica is is a country that we have on our on our hit list. Uh, Thailand um, as well. So yeah, we we definitely do plan to travel internationally um, once once we don't have our dogs with us. Cool. So for anyone out there who's interested in this sort of life, is there? any advice you would give or are there any resources that you used as you're preparing to transition to this lifestyle that you would recommend? Um, we just went on a lot of, a lot of RV forums and just kind of listen to what, to what people are, are talking about, what problems they're having, what, what advice they have. But really there is, there's only so much that, that you can do. Um, you really do learn as you go. Um, the, I, I guess the one bit of advice that I would have, especially as you're buying things, uh, to start this lifestyle is the first RV you buy, whatever it happens to be, whether it's a trailer, a fifth wheel or a motorhome, I can guarantee you that will not be your only RV. In fact, you will probably find many reasons to upgrade or downgrade, uh, for that matter in, in the very near future. So don't spend your life savings on, on your first RV. Just get a a relatively inexpensive RV that works for you and get out there and just kind of live at it. See, see what you like, see what you don't like. And you'll probably be changing in in the relatively near future all right so and if you can buy something a little bit smaller than you think you need do it the smaller the better when it comes to camping um especially when you want to get out there in the middle of nowhere and boondock um you know, like in the middle of the desert or the wilderness or whatever this the smaller your rig the easier job you will have to actually get there and some campsites even will not allow rvs longer than 30, 30 feet is generally the, uh, the cutoff with some of these RV parks. Uh, so definitely the, the, the smaller, uh, the better with, uh, with RV. Cool. And to define boondocking, that's just, just staying out in the middle of nowhere without uh, any yes. sort of plugs or <laughs> anything like exactly. that. Exactly. No, no hookups, no water connection, no sewer, no power. So if you have solar, you can certainly generate there. If you have a generator like a Honda 2000, um, then, you know, you, you could generate your own power that way, but there's nothing to plug into. You are literally parked out in the middle of nowhere with, with, uh, no really communication around you <laughs> and no rent. No, exactly. <laughs> Zero rent. So that's the key. So what have you learned over the last year? Uh, what do you think your next RV would look like? It, you know, if anything, it would be a smaller RV. Right. We have a 30 foot Airstream. That's that, that's like I said, about 200 square feet. But I mean, if we were going to, if we were to change this thing out, it would probably be something in the 25, maybe 28, uh, foot length. So we, yeah, we, we would definitely go smaller. Um, just so we can get to, to more places, but we don't really have a good idea about that yet because we've really only stayed in one place, this, this RV park here in Tucson. Once we start traveling, we'll, we'll get to know some of the campsites a little bit better, where we can fit, where we can't. Um, so we'll, we'll have a better idea of what we would upgrade to, uh, or downgrade as, as the case may be, uh, later on af- after we do some traveling. That's awesome. I can't wait to read about all your 
adventures once you hit the, hit the road full time it's going to be fantastic um i usually end all my interviews just asking like if you had one piece of advice for someone who's hoping to achieve financial independence what would it be the one piece of financial advice i would have is you need to want it bad enough that's it once you want it bad bad enough all the other pieces just kind of fit into place you're motivated to downgrade your cell phone or not upgrade your your phone every year you're motivated maybe to cancel cable or satellite tv maybe you don't need esp and maybe you don't need the cable stations or the uh, the the movie channels um so th- things like that if you want it bad enough the pieces often fall in into place if you don't then it's probably going to be a little bit more of a struggle yeah couldn't agree more <laughs> um so if people want to get in touch with you what's the best way <laughs> Uh, well, my blog, thinksaveretire.com, on Twitter, it's at thinksaveretire. Um, we also maintain the the YouTube uh, channel that you mentioned earlier. It's That one is um, – I do have a Think Save Retire YouTube channel, but the one that we maintain more is called A Stream in Life. And that's streaming w- without the G at the end, so stream in life. Okay. And uh, that's where we document our – our RV adventures and film the majority of what, what we do on a daily basis. Cool. Yeah. I was, uh, getting sucked into some of those videos today. Actually, they're really good. <laughs> what, what kind of camera do you use for that? Just I'm curious. I have a Sony a 6,000, uh, mirrorless digital camera, oh, cool. very small, very, very lightweight. And, um, yeah, it, it, it works well. Yeah. It looks really good. So cool. I'll link to all those things in the show notes. Um, but Steve, I really appreciate you taking the time today to talk with me. This has been great. And, uh, I'm sure there's a lot of people out there with an RV, RV dream. So this is going to be a lot of good information. So, uh, yeah, good luck, uh, making the transition to the full time on the road here in a month. And, uh, I can't wait to see where you guys go. Thanks so much for having me. All right, Steve, take care. Talk to you soon. Alrighty, bye-bye. Bye. Finance.